the edge for free. Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter Eve. So glad you're here for another special. If you would, let's stand together. And let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin this time of worship together. Well, so we got to thank you. We come before you today. We thank you for this time we have to come into this place to sing you songs of praise. Lord, we celebrate the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. You're the reason we come. You're the reason we sing. So be lifted up and glorified above everything else. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I, I wonder, do you know him? <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Tyler couldn't find any fault in him. Terror couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Well,
good to see each one of you here today and uh, we share together in honoring our risen Savior. I wanted to share a picture with you from yesterday. Uh, this is uh, some of the kids and adults that was out picking up the Easter eggs yesterday, right? They was a bunch of kids here. I, I would guess that you know, maybe a, a hundred kids and a bunch of adults and I, I said this morning, I had a kid, Kyle, before we put all the eggs out there yesterday morning, I said, uh, you think we got enough eggs? And he said, I think there's about 3,000. So, <laughs> but somehow or another, about 15 minutes. <laughs> well, we was, before we got started with that yesterday, I thought Kyle did an excellent job because he took that opportunity to share with the kids and with the adults what Easter was really about. And then after he did that, he said, now let's have some fun finding some eggs. So then there you go, they scattered all over the place. And I enjoyed watching them, these, these kids run around. And I, you could just see the anticipation in their faces when they got those eggs gathered up and they started breaking them open to see what was inside of them. It really was heartwarming to watch them. And they really had a good time. So bless you for helping out in that. That's wonderful. I was wondering about this so later after I got to thinking about that, and I was, you know what? I wonder how the Easter eggs got involved with Easter and how that kind of tradition. I mean, there's all kinds of them going on. So uh, when I got home, I, you know, I got the internet, so I go on and I start reading and looking and seeing what, uh, how this come about and uh, how it come into existence. And you may be surprised that there's been egg hunts for hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years. And I had no clue. In America, it started in the 1700s with the Pennsylvania Dutch. So I, I just, you know, as I'm reading this stuff, the egg was considered a symbol of life and rebirth. And so there, there's a good chance to go and read some of that. It's kind of interesting what some of the thoughts we have on that. Around our house, ever since kids, uh, we've had Easter egg hunts. And uh, we've had, you know, grandkids now and all that. And I, want, I brought an egg with me to show you because uh, and my, my grandkids may want to run up here and see if they can open this up because this is what we call the golden egg. And we hide these golden eggs in our yards and, uh, and it's kind of a prize because there's always something special in these eggs. And, and so they just love to uh, hunt them up. Also brought another colonnade with me this morning, and it is red. And I thought it was kind of interesting when I was thinking about this meditation and coming up with that. I tried to find a red egg, and I have one red egg. And I don't know, yesterday I was looking through the box, I didn't think I seen any red eggs in that. So what's the significance of this red egg? Well, in past history, they colored their eggs red. And the reason that they did that is it represents the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. I thought that was really interesting in that. Look and see if you got any red eggs. Maybe they all should be red. Now I have one last egg. And that egg is white. Maybe this should symbolize the purity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When He died upon the cross, shed His blood, and had no sin in His life, perfect. And then, three days later, He arose from the grave. The day we celebrate today. By His resurrection, He washes those who call Him Lord. And He makes them white as snow. Let us pray. Father, we come to you now and we come about your table. We were so thankful that Christ was willing to go to that cross to lay his life down there and his blood that was poured out for remission of our sins. And Father, we celebrate the resurrection this day. And we look at that in each one's life. And we know each day we are so thankful because he was rose. He gives us hope of eternal life. And Father, we just ask you now to bless each one as partake of this bread and this cup. In Jesus' name, amen.
laid on my criminal's cross. Darkness rejoices, though heaven had lost.
after the service. And uh, next time we do have a sign-in procedure, so make sure we get the right kids the right parents. So, uh, but we're glad to have you here. Glad to see all the kids. What a fun week we've been having. Uh, last week with the triumphal entry, Thursday night with the special communion service. It was just wonderful. I thought I'm partial, but my dad did a great job on that sermon. That was that was great. And then uh, the Easter egg hunt yesterday. Do we have a picture of that, like of the eggs back there, Eli? I, I, I mean, it looked like it had snowed Easter eggs. I mean, you can't really, it, those little dots are all Easter eggs. And they were everywhere. They were in the trees, the bushes, everywhere. Uh, Midweek, Jerry came by and said, you need more eggs? We went down county. Just like, there was like 2,300 eggs. And then more people came by and filled more eggs and dropped more off after that, Jerry. So it was awesome. 3,000 probably a pretty conservative count. Everybody had plenty of eggs. Well, let's get to the Gospel. But to do that, I want you to turn to the Gospel of John chapter 20. And I thought about this message, and I thought about unexpected visions. And in John chapter 20, that's what it's about. It's about an unexpected vision of what we first find. How do you do in life when... Things don't play out the way you imagine them to be. Are you pretty calm? Get a little crazy? A little grumpy? No finger pointing. As we laid out our spring break travels uh, well in a month in advance, we said we want to do a, a camping trip. We'll pull our camper and we're going to go down south. And we had it all laid out. I had a vision first of stopping at Raccoon Mountain, Tennessee, outside of Chattanooga for a few days. You know why? Because there's great mountain biking there. Okay? Uh, that's going to be great. The kids are going to love it, and so will that. And there's all kinds of great things in Chattanooga we can take in. I was excited. I was excited about Chattanooga as I was about going on down to South Georgia where we would do the beach thing. Well, I looked at the weather forecast the week of our trip, and wouldn't you know it, not only was it going to be rainy in Chattanooga, Tennessee, as we found out, it ended up snowing, I believe, in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I said, you know, what kind of camping trip would that be to just be in thunderstorms and snow? That doesn't sound like much fun to me. So let's go on farther south a little quicker, and let's just deep, let's not even stop in Tennessee. And so literally we headed south and we really didn't know where we were going because the weather was projected to be so terrible. We were traveling with Kirk and Jessica. They were pulling their camper. First night accommodations were great. Uh, we had a Walmart. We parked at. <laughs> and, uh, White House, Tennessee. Very nice. Everyday low prices. It's great. <laughs> Love the rate too. Very, very affordable rate. Free. They said, where are you guys going tomorrow? We said, I don't know. I don't know where the weather's good at. Really? Don't really know. And we found this little pocket in South Georgia where the weather was going to be good. Like 75, 80 degrees. I said, that's where we're going. Well, what's there? I don't know. But that's where we're going because that's where the weather's good. So we took off. And as we took off, we realized that our friends Tim and Kathy that used to live here in Smithville, that they live there in that little pocket of Georgia where the weather was good. So we called them and said, hey, we're heading away. We're going to stay in the campground. They said, no, no, no. Come and camp in our driveway. That's got the Walmart ring. Even better. Because Kathy keeps a stocked fridge all the time. If she knows you're coming, she goes out and shops more. If you ever went to her house for dinner when she lived here, you know that about her. She's always feeding you. And they have a monster, like, 70-inch curved TV, and they have all the channels. We don't have that at home. And so we pulled up in their driveway, and we just uh, bummed their electricity and their water. And wouldn't you know that the unexpected, I think, probably worked out better than our original plans. Even our plan of doing some mountain biking. And, and not only that, I mean, it was free child care. Uh, on Sunday, they insisted that they watch our children so Aurora and I could go on a date in Savannah. And Savannah is a great place to go on a date. I mean, that's, that's a good deal. 
But you know, I have to admit, when I first saw the weather report, I was a little discouraged. Because I knew things weren't going to play out the way I planned them to be. See, we have visions in our life of how things are supposed to be in our lives. Yet we find that life seldom plays out to the way we envision it to be. Unforeseen circumstances happen. Your boss tells you we're going a different direction and it doesn't include you. Those are tough times. You get a text from the one that you think is the love of your life and it says, let's just be friends. <laughs> wasn't the vision you expected, was it? But I want to ask a question this morning. Could the unexpected work out for the good? Just could it? Or is the unexpected bad automatically bad because that isn't the way you planned it? Well, in John chapter 20, uh, Mary had a vision of how things were supposed to be. She was going to the tomb of Jesus. And she had a vision of how the tomb should be, how the stone should be in place. And in verse 1 we read, early in the morning, on the first day of the week, while it's still dark out, that's early in the morning, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And immediately she thought, this is bad. So she went running to Peter and John and she said, they've taken the body of our Lord from the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. And so immediately Peter and the other disciple that we know is John, they, they start out for the tomb. And we were talking about running this morning, Warren. We know that... Uh, John was faster than Peter, only because he says, he makes sure to say, and I got there first. <laughs> and so he gets there, there first, and he looks into the tomb, and he sees the strips of linen lying there, but he doesn't go in. And then Simon Peter, he finally arrives on the scene, out of breath, and he goes on in, and he sees the strips of linen lying there, but then he notices something different. He notices that the cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. And then the other disciple who reached the tomb first, he went inside, he saw, and he believed. That's the resurrection story. And in this resurrection account in John, Mary first experienced an unexpected vision, and the empty tomb of Christ for Mary was not good news. Read in verse 1 that Mary saw that the stone sealed the tomb had been moved. And the Greek word for saw in verse 1 is a word called blepo. And what word in our English language that closest, that, that relates closely to blepo is she glanced. Glance. Just, just to glance at something. And at first glance, the vision that she sees is not good. If you would glance up here, you would notice that I have my NCAA tournament bracket. Just, you just look up here, you see that. And at first glance, you don't know who's winning what game, or if my bracket's busted, I'll tell you it's busted. But you know, you wouldn't notice in there that um, UK lost, and all the angels rejoiced in heaven. And there was a great party of hosts. Because he just glanced, right? He just, just took a quick look at it. UK fans, Jesus loves you too, and so do I, okay? We like to have a lot of fun around here. Uh, only reason I didn't pick on Purdue is because they had that injury, okay? But um, <laughs> we glance at things, and you just, I mean, you, you, at first glance, maybe you looked in the middle and saw Gonzaga, and that just didn't happen. I wanted it to happen last year. It didn't happen. I, I thought, man, that'd be awesome. But he didn't notice all the details because it was a glance. And at first glance, Mary, she observes the heavy stone was no longer sealing the tomb. And her only possible reason for the stone being rolled away is something bad must have happened. Oh no, somebody came and they stole the body of my Lord. That would be terrible, right? Grave robbers. And perhaps this morning you can identify with Mary... You've witnessed tragedy and experienced bad luck and 
You've seen so much bad news in your life that most things that are different than the way you envisioned them to be at first glance have to be bad. Oh no, the teacher just asked me to stay after class. Not the vision I had. It's got to be bad, right, Gavin? Yeah. <laughs> oh no, the school's calling again, right? Oh no, not the vision I had. It, it, it's got to be bad. Oh no, I've got a letter from the IRS. How come when we get that letter, we never think it's a check? Like, oh, it, I paid too much. They're sending me some money back. <laughs> no, immediately we were like, oh no, these people can end my life. <laughs> or have I to open the mail and like, oh great, I've been summoned for jury duty, right? See, the problem is we only glance at a scene and immediately if it's different than we expected it to be, we kind of panic and we never think it's for the good. And that's what Mary did. I came home from spring break all refreshed, had a great time, had a great time there in the driveway of my friends. I can give you their address if you'd like. Great place to vacation. And then I had a great time down at Jekyll Island, Georgia. Oh, that's fabulous. It's wonderful. We came on back at Boondock and at Cabela's. Yeah, that was great. Great. Another free charge there. Wonderful place to stay. Recommend that outside of Atlanta. Came on home fully refreshed. Came home to a stack of mail. Have you ever done that? So you know the process. You sit down at the kitchen table and you put the trash can right there because about 90% of it goes right in the trash. You know, you open it. You rip it. You go into the metal. Junk metal. Bill. Uh-oh. Superior Court 2. That gets you tense, don't it? I didn't envision you getting that letter. Open it up. You've been summoned for jury duty. I had to be there in two days. I'm like, are you kidding me? At first glance, I was completely bummed. I didn't take into consideration of our court's justice system and why it's the greatest justice system in the world. I didn't think about any of that. I didn't think about my civil duty as an American to, to, to our society. Instead, I did what all of us do when we get jury duty. I pouted. Oh no, this, this is ridiculous. I've got plans next week. There's so much going on. I can't believe this. See, my vision of how things were supposed to be in the next week were totally wrecked. They were interrupted, interrupted completely. And I couldn't see anything good coming from it because I only glanced at what jury duty would look like. And I say all this because I believe many just glance at the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so the resurrection isn't a priority like it is for you this morning. It doesn't mean much to them. They've heard about it. They may have glanced at an empty picture of the tomb, but like Mary, they don't really see the resurrection as life-changing good news like we do. And so for them, Easter's just a holiday that's not a holy day. Well, at first glance, Mary runs to tell Peter and John the, the terrible news, and Peter and John they run to the tomb, and verse 5, they get over and they looked in. John glanced, he sees the burial linens lying there. Then Simon Peter, he goes in and he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. He saw that the cloth was full. The Greek word for saw in verse 6, pay attention, hang on to me with this. This is all going somewhere. The, the Greek word for saw in verse 6 is thero. And the thero is to gaze. To gaze. When we gaze, what do we do? We steadily look. We take note of the details on the scene. We're, we're studying it a little bit. And gazing at the unexpected vision of the resurrection is puzzling to Peter. By gazing at the tomb, Peter knows that this can't possibly be the work of grave robbers. I mean, who's going to steal a body and take the time to unwrap all the grave clothes and then fold them? I mean, it'd be easier to transport a body in the grave clothes rather than take them off. Yet Peter's confused about this unexpected vision before him. He doesn't realize a resurrection has occurred. Now I wonder if majority of people, Pharaoh, the resurrection, 
They just gaze at Holy Week. I mean, they know the details. They, they know about Jesus' triumphal entry on Sunday. and They know about the institution of Lord's Supper on Thursday and His crucifixion on Good Friday. They may even have saw Jesus carrying the cross down 37. You see that this week? Pretty awesome. I turned a corner and there was Jesus with the cross on Good Friday. That's pretty neat. They may even know about the resurrection on Sunday. They know the details. Participate in the Holy Week services. But they only gaze at Holy Week and they've never experienced the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They've never experienced, as that first song we said, He's alive in us. <coughs> and maybe this morning that's where you are. You gaze at the empty tomb, but the power that rose Jesus from the dead has never come alive in you, and so you're still living in your sin, still haunted by your past, and you're missing out on the joy of this new life. I can speak so personally about this because that was me for many years. I knew the Bible stories. I had the books of the Bible memorized. Celebrated all the significant Christian holidays. Attended church. Called myself a Christian. But Christ wasn't alive in me. I identified myself with Jesus. But my identity was not in Jesus. Church was a place I went to rather than a body, a family that I belonged to. See, the problem was I had only Pharaoh. I'd only gazed at the empty tomb. I had confessed Christ with my mouth, but I had never accepted Christ in my heart, surrendering myself before His cross, knowing that my sin is what sent Him to the cross. I was baptized, but I was never immersed with Christ, dying to my sin to rise and live the new life by the power that is in Him. See, when it came to the tomb, I would just gaze at the empty tomb, and the celebrating I would do at Easter was because of tradition. But I'm going to tell you things are different now. The celebrating I do today is not because of tradition, it's because of transformation. And there's a big difference. Hang with me. Jesus has completely changed my life. And the vision that He has for me is totally different than the vision I had for me. And it was completely unexpected. I had my plans. But His plans overruled my plans. I had my own plan in life. I mean, how many preachers out there have a six-year break of Bible college that's filled with the army? Uh, not a lot of us. Why? Because there was a conflict of visions. But I'm going to tell you, the unexpected vision that he had for my life that I didn't realize, it wins. It's amazing. And I wouldn't change it for anything. And see, Jesus, he died for everyone so that those who receive His new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. He has this new vision for us. This transformation that takes place and He sees your life and He says, you know what, I have a vision for you. And I would challenge you this morning to embrace that vision of transformation that Jesus has for you. See, the prayer of Smithville Christian Church is to welcome everyone to be transformed by Jesus Christ. That's the reason we're here on this corner, folks. It's to welcome everyone to be transformed by Jesus Christ. You know, John experienced that transformation. And in verse 8, we're told that he goes into the tomb and he saw and he believed. The Greek word for Saul in verse 8 is a word called hurao. And to hurao is much different than to blepo or to thero. It's much different than to just glance or to gaze. To hurao is to perceive what you see, is to understand what's happening. 
And John, he hurrahed and he believed. He hurrahed the empty tomb. And when he hurrahed the empty tomb, he realized that the unexpected vision is good news, not bad news. And it's good news for us because Jesus, he claimed to be the Christ, the Son of God, to be sent by God, to be one with the Father, to deserve honor equal to that given to the Father. To have authority to forgive sins. To be king. To be lord. To be lord of the temple. Lord of the Sabbath. Lord of the angels. And all of these were put on the line when Jesus was crucified on the cross. And then laid in the tomb and wrapped in the grave clothes. But on Sunday morning when the resurrection power came alive. And the stone was rolled away. And the tomb was empty. All of Jesus' claims were shown to be true. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. His claims would be shown to be true. And who through the spirit of holiness was declared by power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Amen. It's good news. And I would challenge you this morning to grow the empty tomb. To perceive what you see here. With eyes of faith. Knowing that we serve the risen living Savior. When I served on jury duty a few weeks ago. The defense attorney made a closing argument opposing the state's charges. It was a very, he, was, he was a good attorney. He really did it with passion. And in doing so, he challenged we, the jury, to review the evidence. He said, test the evidence. Carefully review the evidence. And so we did. For hours, we reviewed the evidence. We took the many pictures of the crime scene and looked at those gruesome images and comparing every detail. We listened to the 911 phone call over and over and over again. We went over the eyewitness testimonies, carefully just any detail that might be different or conflicting. I believe we've hurrahed the evidence because we knew that the evidence would tell the truth about what had happened that night. In John chapter 20, verse 10, Peter and John, they viewed the evidence at the resurrection scene. They, they viewed all the evidence of the empty tomb. And they took hold of the truth of what really had happened, that a resurrection had occurred, and then they went home. But Mary, she stayed on the scene with all the evidence there, just like Peter and John had. And she wept. She cried over that evidence. And as she's weeping, as she's crying there at that empty tomb because this vision is not what she expected to see that morning, she saw, she gazed at two angels in white. Pharaoh gazed at two angels in white. And so they asked her, they said, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away and I don't know where they've put him. And then she turned and she Pharaoh, she saw, she gazed at Jesus standing before her. And she didn't realize it was Jesus. Mary is so distraught over all the pain that she had witnessed on Friday. She is so hurt that she's unable to recognize her Lord as He stands before her. She's so trapped in the heartbreak what does she do? She accuses Jesus of stealing his own body. <laughs> Sir, if you've taken him, you tell me where you put him, then I'll take him back. <clears throat> and I believe all of us have been where Mary is. Unable to imagine anything good coming out of the chaos that surrounds our lives. We've been there, right? We're stuck in a mindset that clings to what we've lost in this life. And I would ask this morning, what would free us from that mindset? 
How can we open our eyes to the joy that's around us? That joy you see all the kids walk around with. I believe the answer is to have faith that God is doing something new and wonderful even in the unexpected visions around us. He's calling us to believe Him and trust Him. I know that in all things, God works for our good. He works for the good of those who have been called according to His purpose. Those who love Him. He's doing something good. Even when the world's doing something bad, He's doing something good. Even when life isn't the way you expected it to be, He's doing something good with it. And you will grow closer to Him through the process. He's doing something good. Even if, if what's around you seems to be just horrific, He will do something good. It doesn't say God causes it all. No, there's sin in this world. That's a whole other sermon. There's sin in this world. There's demons at work. There's Satan. There's all that. He doesn't call all that. But He'll take all of that, all of it, and He'll work it for His good. He will bring something good in you, through you, through all of it. You know, after we, the jury, gave our verdict to the judge, I'll just say it's an unpopular verdict for those in the courtroom. The judge read it to the court. There was gas. There was weeping. There was... The defense was upset when they asked for the jury to be polled. You know what that means? That means that each juror is called upon and you must give an account. And personally say before the court that you agree with the verdict. So the judge called out, juror number one, I agree. Juror number two, I agree, Your Honor. Juror number three, that was me, I agree, Your Honor. All 12 jurors personally spoke before the court. And I share this because we're called to give an account of how we see the evidence of the empty tomb. We are. Our spouse can't speak for us. Our parents can't make this decision for us. Our kids can't answer this for us. We are called individually to examine the evidence of the empty tomb and either accept or reject the resurrection of Jesus. Well, in verse 16, that's Mary. She's caught in the conflict. She don't know what to think. Then Jerry Jesus calls out her name, Mary. And when Jesus calls Mary by name, suddenly she sees the evidence of the empty tomb as good news. A resurrection has occurred my Lord is alive. And in verse 18 we read that Mary shares the good news. I have seen Rome, the Lord. This morning Jesus calls out to us. Stephen, Matt, Mary, Heather, Cole, Jennifer, Rat, Lisa, Calls out our names. Jerry, Rita, Glenn. Know that I died for your sin on the cross. Know that it's true that I did resurrect from the grave. And my empty tomb is a testament of my resurrection. Receive my grace and be pardoned. He's calling out to us so we can be set free from the bondage and the power and the shackles of sin. He calls out our names so we can proclaim the good news. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. And this morning, if you've never publicly confessed your faith in Jesus Christ and you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, He's calling you to publicly speak up this morning. This may be uncomfortable. 
This may be an unexpected vision for you as you came here this morning. But it's God's vision for you. So I pray you'll embrace that and you'll come to the front as we sing and declare that you hurabo the empty tomb. See, the Bible tells us that if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. We're going to stand. I'm going to say a prayer in just a moment. And as we sing after this prayer, if you want to accept Jesus, if you want to speak up for Jesus this morning, you come to the front as we sing. Let's bow our heads. Lord, you know each one of us in our lives. You know the unexpected visions as well as the unexpected trials we face. You know the joy that's before us. And we know that you want to lead us into that joy. And so, Lord, may you just lead your people now. Call them through your Spirit by name. They'll respond to your invitation to come and receive the free gift of life. We ask this in Jesus' name.
awesome. Hey, we're so glad to see all of you here. This is typically how our services are at Smithfield, so come on back. Also, one other thing Kyle and I do every Easter, we always say, we should have gave the lilies away. Absolutely. <laughs> and you know, take these lilies home with you and plan and remember your day if you're able to take, take them home so I don't have enough for everyone so especially if you brought a visitor today you take that gift to your visitor okay yeah. now let's pray Lord we thank you for this day we thank you that we have the resurrection truth before us we embrace the evidence of the empty tomb and we thank you that we serve the risen Savior. now may you just lead us in everything and we know that when the unexpected visions happen today and tomorrow it's going to be alright because you're with us and you'll never leave us and never forsake us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.